Good morning. Hi, Ian. Thanks so much for coming back uh, today. He is speaking on Paul's epistle to the Laodiceans. And I think most of us in here know a little bit about Ian, but just to review, he's a Duke graduate. He has a podcast. He's the visiting assistant professor of classics and religious studies at Hamilton College. So thanks again for coming in. Thank you so much. And it's it's wonderful to be back with you. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, let me share my screen with you. A nice um, a nice shot of the archaeological site as it more or less is today uh, in central, well, I guess western central Turkey. Um, today we're going to talk about Paul's epistle to the Laodiceans which if you check uh, the table of contents for your New Testament, you won't find any work going under that title. The starting point uh, for this conversation is the, um, the closing passages of Paul's epistle to the Colossians. Uh, so Paul sends a number of greetings, uh, gives a number of instructions at the very end of the letter to the city of Colossae, uh, and here he says, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, namely the letter to Colossians, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And so that you and see that or may act such that you read also the letter from Laodicea. Okay, so Paul the author of Colossians, has given an instruction to the church in Colossae that they read a letter which he calls from Laodicea. A few caveats before we sort of dive in here. Um, people familiar with New Testament scholarship will know that there is some dispute over the extent of the Pauline corpus. How many of the letters attributed to Paul were actually written by him? If we start all the way on the right, we can see that we know not every letter attributed to Paul in the New Ta in early Christianity was in fact written by Paul. Third Corinthians, which was used pretty widely in the Armenian church, was used pretty widely in the Syriac church. Um, in some groups, uh, it was included in Bibles up until the 1800s. Um, it, the, it, from our evidence for early Syriac Christianity, it seems to have been in their earliest collections of the Pauline epistles. No scholar thinks third Corinthians was written by Paul. If you want to hear more about that letter, I'd love to come back sometime. Uh, there are other letters, the letter, the epistolary correspondence between Paul and Seneca. Paul did not write those. Uh, these are some letters that were, that seem to have been fairly popular in late antiquity. Um, there are a number of others we could talk about. Uh, interestingly, in most in most manuscripts, uh, the what we call Hebrews, the Epistle to the Hebrews, is also attributed to Paul. But this was disputed uh, in the early church, and that dispute has never gone away. Um, most scholars do not believe Paul wrote Hebrews. Um, so then we go back to the left-hand column, and we have these seven undisputed letters: uh, Romans, the Corinthian Epistles, Galatians, Thessalonians, Philippians, and Philemon. Everyone thinks Paul wrote these. Um, and then there's two disputed classes. Uh, and the disputed classes um, are the Deuteropaulines, uh, which, on which scholarship is more or less split, and the pastoral epistles. Um, and the majority of scholars today do not think Paul actually wrote the pastoral epistles. All this to say, for the purposes of our discussion today, I'm going to treat Colossians and Ephesians as if they were in fact written by the historical Paul. Most of what I have to say today will hold up if I'm wrong about that. But there'll be a few places where we are sort of interrogating the um, the sort of travel of letter carriers uh, that will assume, for the sake of this conversation, the traditional position that Colossians and Ephesians were in fact written by Paul. I've changed my mind on this uh, over the last decade a couple times. Um, but for our conversation, we're going to assume Colossians and Ephesians are really written by Paul. Okay, Colossae, in which we find this reference to read the letter from Laodicea, is located in the Roman province of Asia. 
which we would think of as Western Turkey. So uh, let's see here. if you look at this box down here, you can sort of see on um, the little red box is, is the full screen. So you can see all three of the um, cities we're looking at here. On the right hand, uh, we have Colossae, and then 10 miles to its west, we have Laodicea. Um, and then on the other you know, side of the map, um, which I, I maybe maybe a hundred miles, maybe less than a hundred miles away, uh, you have the city of Ephesus, which will come into this picture later. So point one is that Laodicea and Colossae are towns right next to each other, um, ten miles apart. You could one could walk it there and back in a day. So it makes some sense that Paul would uh, expect these churches to be in close contact. They can send greetings to each other. Um, they can greet the, the, the church there. Uh, and we see here the assumption that letters are going to be shared, that this letter to Colossians, unlike, say, some of these other letters, uh, unlike 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians, right, addresses this, you know, very specific issues, that there is someone in their church who uh, is um, sleeping with their stepmother, uh, very specific, uh, there's lawsuits, there's particular things that people have said that Paul is responding to. Colossians seems to assume that it's going to be read by people in other churches, and it ends making that explicit. You know, share this letter with next with near door with uh, next door churches. So scholars will sometimes talk about reading Paul's epistles is really just reading somebody else's mail, and that seems to be less true for at least the epistle to the Colossians. Um, now, uh, the title of my talk was The Letter to the Laodiceans. And it's worth noting that if you read this passage carefully, that's not exactly what it says, right? Um, Paul says, see that this letter I've sent you, so I've sent you, the Christians in Colossia, in the Colossians, I've sent you a letter, and I want this letter to be read in Laodicea. I've, um, and then I want you also to read a letter from the Laodiceans, from the letter that um, from the city of Laodicea. So it is possible, it is a possible reading that they're supposed to read a letter that the Laodiceans sent Paul, because how else would Paul know about it, right? So it's possible that the Laodiceans have sent a letter, or alternatively, maybe somebody traveled to Colossae and Paul is expecting that on their way through Laodicea, they picked up a layer, letter from the Laodiceans to carry over to Colossae uh, to, to bring with, um, so the, 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 the Christians at Laodicea are sending a letter to Colossae. These are possible construals of the text. There's confusing things there, like how would Paul know that the Laodiceans were going to send a letter, at, you know, before he sent, before the traveler arrives right there, there's these are possible they seem unlikely the way this has historically been read both um in antiquity uh and by scholars today is in parallel with paul's instructions to the colossians so paul has sent a letter to the colossians and instructs them to send it over to laodicea so presumably paul has also sent a letter to laodicea and expected them to send it over to colossi um, there's a, a, you can put it in parallel with the instructions to the Colossians and assume that the letter to the Laodiceans is also expected to be shared with the Christians in Colossae. This is how it's been read by pretty much everyone, except for a few scholars who have tried to suggest alternatives. Um, uh, and one interesting piece of evidence for that is the way this has been translated. Um, so, uh, the Latin translation of the Greek here reflects actually multiple different interpretations of this passage. The most popular um, is the use of the genitive plural. So uh, in the Greek, there's actually this preposition from, and the Latin actually drops that preposition out uh, in the most popular translation. Uh, and you get simply um, the letter uh, belonging to the Laodiceans. And while this is also, in theory, open to multiple interpretations, what it does is it removes the suggestion from the Greek that maybe the Laodiceans are actually themselves sending the letter. Um, another popular translation, so that's that's this first one, 
Another popular translation is exactly how I've titled my talk, to the Laodiceans. Uh, you you put the, to, to the church in Laodicea. So you put it into the accusative. Um, and so we also see here uh, the, the Latin is interpreting the text as Paul sending a letter to Laodicea that the Colossians are expected to read. Interestingly, we also see, um, read the letter in Laodicea. Uh, this is a totally different interpretation that no scholar has suggested because it doesn't make sense of the Greek. But this seems to be erasing the extra letter. And we might see why some Christians would want to do this. So if this reading is right, if this interpretation is right, then they're supposed to just read the letter of the Colossians in Laodicea. So they're sharing their letter. Um, and there is, in fact, a few people who translate this uh, extremely literally um, from Laodicea, preserving all the same ambiguities we saw in the first case. So um, there's the setup. There's the mystery. So the mystery is that Paul seems to, on the most plausible interpretation, and in, including an interpretation that goes back to antiquity, uh, seems to be suggesting that Colossians, that Christians in Colossi, Colossi should read a letter that we don't, at least apparently, have. That's going to be the jumping off point for my talk today. Um, any questions so far? Otherwise, I'll just keep going. All right. So what are the possibilities here? Uh, the most obvious possibility is it could just be that we don't have this letter, <laughs> uh, that there is a, a lost letter, um, that Paul wrote a letter to a church that doesn't survive. And there's a good analogy for this. There seems to be a lost letter uh, referred to in 1 Corinthians. Um, there, there's reason to believe that Paul wrote letters, even wrote letters to churches, so sort of circular letters or important letters or author letters in his capacity as an authority that don't survive. Um, so in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, Paul refers back to a letter that he wrote instructing them not to associate with sexually immoral people. But now he says, I am writing to you um, more of the same, basically. Uh, so Paul uh, here refers to a letter that, so far as we can tell, uh, doesn't survive. A letter. Um, so that's possible. Uh, if that's the case, there's not much more we can say about it. We've lost a letter. Full stop. There's another possibility, though. There's a possibility uh, that we have this letter, just under another title. People don't usually give their titles, or, sorry, give their letters titles the way we do New Testament epistles, right? So we have actually lots of lots of mail that survives from Oxyrhynchus, one of these uh, cities in Egypt that has been uh, archaeologically fruitful. And um, there's lots of mail, lots of letters in there. They don't come with titles. Um, when I write an email, uh, actually, I do title my emails, don't I? I put subject headings on them. But antiquity, you don't. <laughs> and back when people wrote uh, wrote letters to people on via snail mail, I don't think it was normal to title them. Um, so presumably, this is true for Paul as well. Presumably, the first copy of Romans that made it to Rome was not called Paul's Epistle to the Romans. Uh, it probably just started Paul and Apostle, right? Um, which is to say, uh, what if we have the Epistle to the Laodiceans? Uh, there was a letter sent to them that has been given a different title in the history of Christianity. And uh, as these texts were canonized, it got a different title. And the most obvious candidate for that is the one authentically Pauline letter that doesn't have a city name on it. Philemon. So this is plausible. Um, just at a, at a superficial level, it's plausible uh, that what if what if Philemon lives in Laodicea? Um, could that be the case? Uh, and then the letter that Paul sent to Philemon in Laodicea. He's expecting the Christians in Colossae to read them. Superficially, or at least uh, prima facie, plausible. There's some more evidence we have. This, this isn't just speculation. We have some more evidence we can use to weigh the plausibility of this. So in Colossians, Paul actually refers to, in that same chapter, Colossians 4, 
Paul refers to a number of figures that are found uh, who are also mentioned in the Epistle to Philemon. So the Epistle to Philemon opens with a couple of greetings of Christians uh, at that church and then goes on to give this instruction that Paul has encountered Ones Onesimus, probably encountered him in prison. Onesimus is probably a runaway enslaved person. And Paul is sending Onesimus back to his enslaver, Philemon, requesting Philemon set him free. So that's the situation. Um, and uh, there are other Christians apparently in the room. And what seems most likely the case is that Onesimus is at least one of the letter carriers. Onesimus is coming with Paul's letter carrier uh, to deliver this letter to Philemon. And indeed, when we read Colossians 4, we find um, I have sent Tychicus, who is the letter carrier, we'll talk more about him in a bit, to you for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And he is coming with Onesimus, the faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. Uh, and then Archippus here is one of the other people greeted at the beginning of the letter to Philemon. So, just beyond the prima facie level, there's some real connections here. It seems that Philemon and Colossians are being carried by the same letter carrier. And if you remember where um, where Colossae and Laodicea are with respect to each other, this makes uh, this would make sense of Philemon being the epistle to the Laodiceans. Um, one person's going to carry them through. Uh, he's traveling with Onesimus. They're carrying both of these letters, um, and uh, they'll they'll stop over potentially uh, in Laodicea first. And then um, Philemon is supposed to do something, either set him free, which is one reading of the text, or send him back to Paul, which is another reading of the text. Um, and then they're going to, apparently, Onesimus is going to keep traveling with Eutychus, uh, sorry, Tychicus, um, over to Colossae. Um, so there are connections here. That That's what has to be said in favor of this theory. There's also a couple problems with this theory. The first one is in the text right here, that uh, Onesimus is said to be one of you, that is a member of the church in Colossae. But if Onesimus is enslaved to Philemon, who lives in Laodicea, which would have to be the case if Philemon is the epistle from Laodiceans, then how is he one of the Christians in Colossae? This is not intractable, right? Maybe one of you just means one of the Christians from this part of Asia. That's possible. Um, maybe Onesimus grew up in Colossae uh, and then uh, his enslaver Philemon moved to Laodicea later. That's possible there's there's other explanations here right um uh but uh this is at least some reason to squint um this also assumes that philemon is going to act the way paul expects him to uh by setting onesimus setting, letting onesimus go immediately so he can continue traveling with eutychus because paul would have had to write both of these letters before obviously before I keep saying Eutychus, which is his name in a different text tradition, Tychicus, uh, the letter carrier, um, before he arrives in Laodicea. Possible. Paul may have just presumed that things are going to work out the way he wants. But there's one other problem with this, which is it's not clear why Paul would want Philemon, the letter, the epistle to Philemon, to be a circular letter. Um if there's any letter in the New Testament that's genuinely somebody else's mail that like doesn't anticipate a wider audience, it's the epistle to Philemon. It's this extremely, sh very short, very specific letter that asks for one specific thing. You know, I've encountered Onesimus. I found him useful. Um, I'm sending him back to you. Uh, I want you to give me permission to keep traveling with um to keep traveling with Onesimus, whether that means setting him free, which is one reading, or just, you know, maybe make giving uh, giving him as a gift to Paul so Tychicus can keep traveling with him, which is another, which is the other reading. Whatever Paul is asking for in Philemon, um, that's the whole letter. That's it. 
I mean, there's there's some little formulaic openings and closings, sort of like you know, um, I'm I'm proud of you, and I'm I you know I founded your church, and I love you very much. Uh, but it's it is the least circular letter of all of Paul's letters. It is the least theological. It is the least. It's a letter we would last expect to be treated uh, as an encyclical, um, as opposed to someone else's mail. Okay, so that's another reason to sort of at least squint at this, that Colossians works. Colossians is what you'd expect of an, of a, a, an encyclical, of a cyclical letter. Um, Colossians is about, you know, the position of Christ in the creation of the universe and uh, his power and how he's overthrown the powers that oppose humanity. And it's sort of a laying laying out Paul's gospel, um, at least one version of Paul's gospel, uh, that is especially amenable to Gentile readers. Um, it makes sense. Uh, and so we're not surprised to read at the end of the letter that he wants Colossians to be read in Laodicea. That's what we'd expect to see. But shouldn't we expect to see something that looks a little more like Colossians being being circulated between Laodicea and Colossae? I think so. Um, and in fact, there's a better explanation, which I'll come to next. But let me pause for any questions of clarification or further elucidation. So if, if the Philemon hypothesis is correct, then that would move the needle on the letter of Colossians to be more uh, um, undisputed than, than disputed, correct? That's, that's right, yep. So this is one of the arguments that's assuming it's, it's authentic. Um, if this isn't authentic, if Colossians is invented, uh, then Colossians is reading Philemon and assuming Onesimus and Philemon are, you know, from Laodicea or from Colossae, um, and so carrying over all the same characters and traveling companions. Um, so someone in the second century or something, or maybe late first century, is reading Philemon which doesn't have any geographic signifiers in there. There's no references to where Philemon is, lives in the actual letter. Um, and is assuming, I mean, actually, maybe he's assuming that one line about who is one of you. Um, the author of Colossians may be assuming that Philemon and Onesimus actually live in Colossae, uh, based on this who is one of you line, right? Um, uh, but I'm, you know, one has to sort of take a position on this. I can't go keep going back and forth on theories for the sake of the analysis. Um, but yeah, I guess if Philemon is the Epistle of Laodiceans, um, I mean, the other possibility is just that the the non-Pauline author the, at the end of the first century just believes Philemon is the Epistle of Laodiceans um, and has included this one of you line because they're close enough in his mind. So... That's other possibility. So I, I think it's I think it's pretty agnostic or pretty neutral on the authenticity of Colossians. Like Colossians, I'm not sure it favors that theory or against it. But I myself am not sold on Philemon as the Epistle of Laodiceans, uh, because I think there's a better candidate. Um, and I think there's some weaknesses to even someone in the late first century imagining Philemon was an encyclical or it was a cyclical letter, a circular letter. Right. All right. So a little bit of a tangent. Is it yeah. worth uh, any comments on how easily or difficult it was for Philemon to be included in the canon and maybe even uh, given how brief it is and how, you know, one topic it is, yep. why would the writer have pointed other people to go read it? No, I think that's exactly right. Why? Why would someone want other Christians, other churches to read this letter is, is a huge question. And it seems to be one argument against this being the epistle to the Laodiceans. But that raises the question of how did this thing end up canonized in the first place? Like, presumably Paul also, like, signed receipts and, you know, <laughs> occasionally sent off other kinds of letters that aren't included. Um, and those aren't canonical. I mean, first, the, you know, proto-Corinthians, for instance, that letter that's alluded to, that's not in the canon. Uh, whatever that was, um, the the most compelling argument or um, explanation for how Philemon ends up in the canon that I've read um, is that it was just part of a group of letters. It got it got sort of grouped in, probably 
probably because it was, you know, it traveled with Colossians from the beginning. So assuming Colossians is authentic, um, it's still Philemon and Colossians are still being uh, um, uh, carried, are still being transported by the same two people who are then presumably copying them together. And so it, get, it gets into a Pauline collection very early. Um, and that's probably how it ends up in the canon is, is my, is, is what I think is the best explanation. Um, so it, it is in fact, this pairing with Colossians, which I think is real. Um, I think they are paired. It's just not Laodiceans. I think Tychicus was carrying three letters, um, uh, Philemon, Colossians and the epistle to the Laodiceans. Um, uh, so I, I think that's how it gets in the canon. It's worth noting that actually the Syriac, the, um, Ephraim writes these commentaries on the Pauline epistles, which are first evidence for the Syriac Pauline collections. And that's what includes third Corinthians and it, it excludes Philemon. It could be just Ephraim didn't find this notable. Um, but there may be reason to believe that some early collections didn't actually include Philemon, uh, which in my opinion is understandable. The things it, it, it's a highly, uh, okay, occasional. Questions. Sorry. The last hands, um, has some oblique attack on the institution of slavery, which of course is also the topic of Philemon. So maybe Paul wanted Philemon to be a circular letter uh, in that same vein. That, that's possible. Um, I don't read Colossians or Philemon as an attack on slavery. Um, I, I know there are some people who read Philemon as more liberative than I do, and they're, they're respectable and admirable scholars. Um, but I see Paul instructing, especially in Colossians, the uh, slaves and obey your masters. Um, we're actually come to that in a bit, so we can look at that passage on screen in a second, um, if you if you'd like to. But no, this is this is possible. So like, um, maybe Paul wants to uh, have Philemon circulated as a sort of this is what it looks like to uh, love enslaved people. It's to treat them the way he's asking Philemon to treat them. That's totally possible. So. I'm not saying the Philemon theory is impossible. I just think there's a better theory, um, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, because Tychicus, we know Tychicus carried one other letter. Uh, so I think that's that's our letter. Um, and that is the letter which is in our New Testament as the epistle to the Ephesians. Um, an alternative title for this talk is uh, a little bit more uh, shock, shock jock, which is there is no epistle to the Ephesians. Um, so theory number two, the epistle to the Ephesians is in fact the epistle to the Laodiceans. Uh, first impressions. There are some really striking similarities between Colossians and Ephesians. There's um, linguistic similarities. So uh, scholars have long noted that Ephesians and Colossians, Paul suddenly starts writing in extremely long periodic sentences um, in a way that he doesn't do anywhere else in his other letters. So the first sentence or maybe it's the second sentence in Ephesians is like 150 words long or something like that, um, which is like way longer than anything we see anywhere else in the new in Paul's letters. Um, uh, there's vocabulary differences that Colossians and Ephesians share. Um, there's stylistic differences these two letters share. Um, and then there's just like straight up content. Uh, that they share that are not found in the other letters. So you can you can see this from literally the very first verses. Uh, these letters are written very similarly. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, is verbatim uh, to the saints. That's not that remarkable. Um, and faithful in Christ, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father. It's not that compelling, but I mean, it's, it's not like it's not a. Uh, it's not dispositive, as they would say. Um, but these letters have almost identical openings. Paul's other letters don't have the same opening. Some of those materials the same, uh, but these are really strikingly similar. Then there's the, the aforementioned household codes. We don't find other household codes in Paul's letters, right? First Corinthians has no generic instructions about how husbands and wives, children, and enslaved people are all supposed to treat each other. Um, but Colossians and Ephesians do. They treat the exact subjects in the exact same order. And they begin each section with the exact same phrase. So wives be subject to your husbands. Husbands love your wives. Children obey your parents. 
um, then this interesting line that they both share, um, and fathers don't provoke your children to anger, is in both, concluding both sections, and then slaves obey your earthly masters. So you you get parallel household codes that are the same, more or less. They basically contain the same material, display the different wording, um, under the same headings, uh, each starting with the same fra phrases. Again, it looks like these things are being written in a similar context, right? Um, the argument I'm trying to make here, I'm trying to suggest, is that Paul writes these two letters at basically the same time, right? He's writing these in parallel. He sits down to write um, write them maybe back to back. And then as as you revise, as he's revising them, which would have been normal um, in letter writing, um, they end up looking very much the same. And then he sends them off together. And here's the most compelling evidence for that. Uh, they're both being carried by Tychicus. So uh, this is the end of each letter. Um, and the language he uses about Tychicus at the end is verbatim the same for like 16 words. Um, so Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister, is found in both. Um, will it, uh, what he's going to do is he will inform you. It's found in both. Um, uh, and he's going to inform you about everything, about me and about everything. And then you get this shared phrase. I sent him to you for this very purpose, in order that you might know the matters concerning us, and so he might encourage your hearts. So that's that's really compelling evidence. Um, this has traditionally been used as an argument that one, at least one of these two letters has to be pseudopolyne, has to be pseudepigrapha. Um, because why would Paul copy himself? Uh, Douglas Campbell of Duke University um, and others have argued that no, this is it's possible um, that someone writing a letter uh, who's editing the letter is going to use a same sort of set phrase or set set of phrases uh, in the sort of conclusion of his letter, writing about the same person for the same purposes for the same projects. So, and I think that's I think that's plausible um, that Paul, in fact, that this passage in particular shows us that Paul is writing these two letters at the same time, and they're being carried by the same person, both to, um, well, as I'll argue in a second, to churches that are right next to each other, and he's expecting them both to read it. Okay, so there's there's my prima facie case that Ephesians is not written to the Ephesians, it's written to the Laodiceans. And I'm going to make this argument stronger. Um, I'll do so before we take, before we take questions and discussion. Which is, is there, in fact, any such thing as the letter to the Ephesians? Um, the phrase in Ephesus is, in fact, found in the second verse. Maybe it's the first verse. The, 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 the first sentence, anyways, of the epistle to the Ephesians. So there's no title. The titles are not original, right? The titles are some later Christian way of categorizing and using these things as reference, you know, the reference aids for Christians who collect letters in a book. Um, but as I mentioned, there's no title on actual letters. Uh, but there is a reference to this letter being sent to the saints who are in Ephesus in the first, in the beginning of this letter. Except that that phrase in Ephesus is not found in our earliest manuscripts. We have one papyrus containing Ephesians. So one text from the second century. That's it. Total one text. It's called P46. And it's missing the phrase in Ephesus. It's just to the saints. The next earliest copy of Ephesians is Codex Sinaiticus from the fourth century. So we have to skip almost 100 years. Uh, again, completely missing. Hagioi tois husin, to the saints who exist, to the saints who are, which is kind of interesting, but no in Ephesus. The, the phrase Ephesus is missing. Um, I don't think it's here. Can you see right here? Can you see my mouse on the screen? Okay, great. Um, a later scribe has come and added it right here. Someone has added in, in Ephesus as a marginal note. They've corrected the text that it should read in Ephesus, but it doesn't. Um, and then our next earliest manuscript also probably our very best manuscript alongside Sinaiticus is uh, Vaticanus, also a fourth century manuscript. And here we find 
uh, to the saints who are, and no in Ephesus, except again, a scribe has added it in the margins. So someone's come along and noticed it was missing or for, for a, who the, someone came along who thought it was missing and added it in, which means Ephesians, which like Colossians looks like a circular letter, which like Colossians and Philemon is being carried by Tychicus, which seems to have been written at the same time, doesn't have any specific address to a church. There are other arguments you can find in the commentaries um, uh, about whether uh, Ephesians, the kinds of arguments Paul makes in Ephesians don't seem to line up with uh, Paul's experience with the Ephesians in the book of Acts. These sort of depend on a number of other assumptions that I'm just not going to go into today. Um, but there are other scholars who think um, there's good reasons to think that the epistle to the Ephesians doesn't look like it's really to the Ephesians. It looks like a circular. And there's actually one more good piece of evidence, um, which is one of the earliest Pauline collections we know of uh, is collected by a heretic named Marcion. I've done another talk on him. Uh, and like P46, our earliest manuscript, um, this uh, Marcion's version of the text, Marcion's version of the Pauline epistles was lacking the pastoral epistles. It's lacking some of these things that we think weren't part of the earliest uh, Pauline collections. And um, Tertullian, who is our best witness to what Marcion was up to, uh, writes, um, initially he says, I'm going to pass over another letter of Marcion's that Marcion uses, which we have been told, which we have, which, sorry, which we hold, we believe to have been written to the Ephesians, but the heretics to the Laodiceans. And later he says, we have it on true tradition of the church that this epistle was sent to the Ephesians, not to the Laodiceans. And then he goes on to accuse Marcion of having, uh, falsified the ascription. So a couple interesting things there. One is Tertullian doesn't appeal to the text of the epistle. Um, in fact, Tertullian goes on to say, we don't know who Ephesians was really written to. Whoever it was written to, it doesn't really matter. That's Tertullian's argument. He doesn't say, can't Marcion read the text? The, line, the text says it was written to the Ephesians. Um, uh, instead, he says, it doesn't really matter who it was written to. Um, we have it on a good tradition that it was written to the Ephesians, and Paul and Marcion th seems to think it was written to the Laodiceans. We have no reason to believe or doubt, I mean, I, in either way, that Marcion himself was responsible for this attribution. Tertullian attributes to Marcion several things that are found in the text tradition of the Pauline epistles, things that Marcion was not himself responsible for. Um, and most scholars think that's probably the case here. There's no particular agenda or motivation for Marcion to rewrite the title so it's actually to the Laodiceans. Probably Marcion's copy um, either had no title and it didn't have the Ephesians uh, address um, or potentially just had the title Laodiceans on it. Um, it's possible that Marcion then, you know, paired this with Ephesians and gave it that title based on his reading of, sorry, paired it with Colossians based his, on his reading of Colossians 4, we're not really sure. Um, but the big the big picture is our best manuscripts suggest this was never an epistle to uh, the Ephesians. And all these internal considerations make it seem that this looks a lot like the letter to Colossians in every respect, was being carried by the same letter carrier um, and... Uh, and very plausibly might have been the letter which Paul sent initially to Laodicea, expecting it to circulate, as the end of Colossians indeed suggests. Okay, that was a lot. Let me take uh, any any questions on that or discussion points? Otherwise, I'll keep going. Okay. Um, where did 
the ascription to the Ephesians come from then? The first copy that has it in it is Codex Clarimontanus. It's a 6th century copy, so much, much later than the others. Um, and you can see it right there on your screen, Epheso, um, that is, to the Christians, to the saints in, in Ephesus. And of course, we don't know is going to be the answer. We don't know how exactly this happened. Uh, but I have, a, I think there's a good, there's a good theory. Um, in Second Timothy, which is one of the pastoral epistles, so probably not actually written by Paul. Most scholars don't believe Paul wrote these, and I think they're right. Um, there's just this passing reference that. Paul sent Tim, uh, sent Tychicus to Ephesus. Uh, and the theory goes that someone saw this and saw, okay, Colossians and a few, and this anon this this other letter that doesn't have any title on it, um, no title at all, no direct address, uh, what we call Ephesians, um, are both are the two letters carried by Tychicus. So you put one and one together, and you say, oh, based on 2 Timothy, probably uh, this letter, um, this letter we call Ephesians, is the letter being sent to Ephesus. So my theory is that this is a late 1st century, early 2nd century uh, inference based on 2 Timothy. And so someone gives it that title, and someone adds in... Uh, the saints in Ephesus, maybe originally as a marginal note, maybe, and then some later scribe thought that was just part of the text and inserted it. Um, that's probably how most um, scri so called scribal corruptions of the text or ed chain corrections or changes to the text happen, is they often seem to be readers' notes that find their way into the text. So, uh, I think that's the best theory for how Ephesus. Um, ends up how the Ephesians ends up getting that title. Um, it's interesting to note uh, that Acts says that someone named Tychicus, presumably the same guy, uh, was from Asia. Um, and the Western text of that, so a sort of later version of that text that's been corrupted one way or another, um, changes that to Ephesus. Uh, so by, let's say, the, the, the middle of the second century, when this text is being rewritten, there's an association of um, this figure with Ephesus. Although there's this extra weird feature that uh, he's also called Eutychus in this version of the text, which is the name of the boy who falls out the window. Um, so it's hard to know what to do uh, with the Western text of Acts. We can just kind of ignore it. Um, uh, I think the, the se second Timothy four is the more relevant one. Uh, I only include the Acts 20 thing because commentaries will say well the western text of acts says he was from ephesus and that's only kind of true <laughs> because it also changes his name to refer to another character from the book of acts so um worth sort of putting a big asterisk over that um i can call out james dunn i guess he he makes this mistake without really looking into it it seems um he wrote a commentary on this okay so there's my theory of what historically speaking the epistle to the laodiceans really was um i have more to say but i should pause there a second because there's that is not what most christians have thought in the year in most of, for throughout most of europe uh sorry throughout europe for most of christian history um which is the next point i'm going to raise but okay any questions otherwise i'll move on There's another possibility. We might have a 15th Pauline epistle, the so-called Latin epistle to the Laodiceans. There is, in fact, and here it is, a Pauline epistle to the Laodiceans that circulates in many, well over a hundred, Latin Bibles. This is Codex Fuldensis. It's 
one of the earliest and best manuscripts of Jerome's Vulgate. So the most popular Latin Bible, you know, the the Latin Bible with a capital T L, you know, the Latin um uh of Europe for all of late antiquity in the Middle Ages. And if you flip through the Paul's epistles, you'll find that there are, in fact, 15 Pauline epistles. The 13 we think of, Hebrews, and Paul's epistle to the Laodiceans. Complete with, um, you can't see it very well here, but it's actually right down here. Uh, the, the Pauline epistles circulate with these little prologues on them, which are not printed in any modern Bible. But these prologues tell, tell us where Paul wrote these letters from and to, and some information about the circumstances. Um, they're historically dubious, obviously, but they were really popular in Latin Bibles. And this copy of Paul's Epistle to Laodiceans comes complete with one of these Pauline prologues. The scribe who wrote this tells us where Paul was when he wrote this letter. And where's my mouse? Sorry. And unsurprisingly, you find this text sandwiched right here between Colossians and 1 Thessalonians, um, right in the middle of Paul's letters. Uh, this is notable because there are other sort of New Testament dubia, um, things that are sort of quasi-canonical that get shoved to the end of the New Testament sometimes. So the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, the Epistle of Barnabas, um, 1 Clement, uh third corinthians in fact um we'll we'll find bibles that include these texts but they'll put them at the end um even the apocalypse of peter uh or some of these other non-canonical texts from our perspective um were occasionally included in bibles but always at the end probably reflecting their somewhat dubious uh status that's probably also why the apocalypse of john ends up at the end of the new testament um, it was highly contested uh, and often rejected by some early Christians. Um, but not Laodiceans. Uh, our earliest copy of Laodiceans, in fact, um, well over 100 copies, uh, include it right here in its canonical location, right? Right right where it ought to be, right after Colossians. Um, and uh, here's my translation of it. Uh, I, I'm not sure how legible it is in the room you're standing in. So let me just um, read it. Uh, Paul, an apostle, not from humans, nor by a human, but by Jesus Christ. So probably that's assuming the meaning of apostle, a, a person sent. So a person sent not from humans, nor by a human, but by Jesus. To the brothers who are in Laodicea, grace to you and peace from God, the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to Christ through all my prayer since you are remaining in him and persevering in his works, expecting his promise in the day of judgment, and you should not be delivered by the vain talk of certain insinuating people in order to expel you from the truth of the gospel, which is proclaimed by me. And now God may cause that those who are coming from me for the advancement of the truth of the gospel, devoting, serving, and doing charity Oh, that's a little weird. And the works of salvation for eternal life. And now my bonds exist openly. My bonds which I suffer in Christ, in which I rejoice and am glad. And for me, this situation is for the sake of everlasting salvation, which has itself happened by your prayers and is being aided by the Holy Spirit, either by life or by death. Indeed, life is truly in Christ for me, and dying is a joy. And in this very situation, he will perform his mercy in you, so that you will have the same love and be single-minded. Therefore, beloved, as you heard when I was present, so persevere and act in fear of God, and you will have life in eternity. Indeed, it is God who is the worker for you. Um, and do without withdrawing what you are doing. And that is, beloved, rejoice in Christ, and beware of those who are immoral in profit or something, or trying to make money. Um, may all your requests be open before God and be firm in the sense of Christ and do what is sound and true and chaste and just and lovable and what you have heard and received keep in your heart and you will have peace the saints greet you 
may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit and cause the letter of the Colossians to be read to you. So, we might have it. That might be it. Potentially. Um, it's worth noting the very first reference we have to this text, even before this manuscript, comes from Jerome. And he says, um, he's talking about other letters attributed to Paul that weren't actually written by him. And he says, um, some read also a letter to the Laodiceans, but it is rejected by everyone. So, that's interesting. In fact, that's self-contradictory. <laughs> um, uh, if some are reading this, is how is it rejected by everyone? And while Jerome condemns this text, um, it's perhaps deeply ironic uh, that this text survives almost exclusively in manuscripts of Jerome's Vulgate. So here are two beautiful 12th century copies with little depictions of uh, Paul, um, of uh, Paul's epistle to the Laodiceans. And later Christian authorities um, had different opinions about this text. Uh, Gregory the Great said it was authentic. It was really written by Paul, but it is not canonical, he says. It's authentic and it's good to read, but it wasn't, um, it isn't authoritative for uh, Christian teaching. That's Gregory the Great's position. Kind of a big deal in Christian history, Gregory the Great. Uh, and other Christians felt similarly. Sometimes Jerome and Gregory's uh, verdicts are actually copied into manuscripts of Laodiceans. They'll, they'll be appended to the end. And sometimes one or the other, or sometimes both of them. <laughs> so you can see sort of debates over the authenticity of this epistle in the manuscript tradition itself, which is my current research project. Um, this was part of the very first Bible translated into English. Wycliffe includes the epistle to Laodiceans in his Pauline letters. Uh, and it circulates as part of the first English Bibles, as well as many of the old Germanic, French, um, Czech, Slavonic. Uh, this, by, this is translated into many of the sort of uh, vernacular languages um, of the church. And uh, Christians, including notably Quakers, uh, continued to use this text as authoritative scripture in the early Americas. Um, I've been hoping to dig into this, but there's apparently evidence of like uh, Bible studies in uh, North Carolina Quaker meeting houses, particularly um, con using Laodiceans. And we know many early American Bibles, um, they would actually make, if, if the printing didn't have Laodiceans, they would make pamphlets containing Laodiceans to insert into your Bible. Um, so uh, this was a popular text, uh, has been a popular text for um, 1500 years. It's also been contested that whole time. You can find authorities throughout saying this wasn't written by Paul. Uh, and the reformers were uh, not fond of this text at all. So you don't find this um, in early uh, reformer Bibles. Okay. There's most of my talk. Um, I could go into details with extra pictures of that end stuff. But I'm coming up on my time. So I'd love to stop for questions about any part of that. Let it be said, I mean, it's. I think I made it clear. I think Ephesians is Laodiceans. <laughs> so assuming Colossians is authentic, or even if it's not authentic, I think the author of Colossians is thinking about Laodiceans and is referring to Laodiceans. Or sorry, we're thinking about Ephesians as the epistle to Laodiceans. I do not think this text is authentic. Um, it seems to be largely stitched together from other Pauline phrases. That said, so is Colossians with, Ephesus, with Ephesians. So, um, but uh, those are the three options, Lost, Ephesians, or Philemon, or we actually have it. So I've got a question. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. If your theory is correct, does it have any substantive meaning for how we interpret this letter? And does it have any practical implications for the way we think about our Christian faith? Yeah, I mean, one of one of the things is um, there's a long 
there's a long controversy over what situation Paul is addressing in Colossians and and Ephesians and trying to piece together specifically um, the heresy addressed in Colossians and the sort of Jewish Christian situation in Ephesians. Uh, but if so, Colossians is definitely a circular. That's sort of given. So I think it's sort of implausible. Just even if my theory is wrong, um, it's implausible to read Colossians that way. And so probably a fool is errant to try to reconstruct a so-called Colossian heresy. And part of the problem with this is like, it's really impossible. The the things Paul critiques in Colossians are like completely disconnected viewpoints that we don't have any group that hold, held them all together. So that's obvious. But if I'm right, we should apply the same sort of lens or expectations to Ephesians as well. So instead of trying to read Ephesians and reconstruct a historical situation there um, between, you know, the two, the, the two Jews and Gentiles thing that's going on in Ephesians 2, um, uh, some of the sort of uh, so-called household, you know, the controversies people have tried to use to interpret Ephesians 5. Um, as you read through the letter, uh, you can find some commentaries that are trying to thoroughgoingly interpret this as an occasional letter. And that if I'm right, that's wrong. That's the wrong way to do it. Instead, um, we should read Ephesians as a intentionally non-specific letter that's intended to sort of be circulated and contain sort of general principles that are generally applicable to Gentiles um, in Asia. And it might also lend some credence to uh, um, the authenticity of these letters vis-a-vis -vis, like, did Paul actually write these? Um, since the lack of occasionality may be the very thing that explains Paul's distinct language there, that he's writing in a different style, maybe he's actually using a different scribe, um, and the fact that these are so formulaic look like they're sort of the result of a larger compositional process, rather than being a letter Paul just jotted off like he does, he seems to have to 1 Thessalonians or Romans or 1 Corinthians. So they do change how we approach the text in several ways. It's not like Paul is suddenly saying something radically different. It's sort of the expectations we bring to reading these letters, um, that this is not a letter to a church in Ephesus. This is a letter that was intended to circulate among multiple churches in the uh, Roman province of Asia, what we think of as Western Turkey, among Gentiles, um, as a sort of generic account of what Paul has to say, nothing specific, so. Thank you. Our time is up, but thank you so much, and we always yeah. enjoy your talk, and I know some other people may have questions for you. I'm sure we've got an email or something that we can um, have them email you. So thank you again. Yes, We'd please. love for our appreciation in the class. Thank you all. It's really I'll a pleasure. I'll, I'll find as well. Yeah. So next week, we have Diana, Dr. Diana Butler-Bass, who is an author, speaker, preacher, uh, who will also be preaching in the chapel that day as well. She's going to come and teach us, so we'll look forward to that. We'll see that next week. And just a reminder, those of you who have the book, that's for study in April, and the author will be teaching us. He taught a class a few weeks ago, and he's coming back in April to give us a few weeks of a study on that particular book. All right, thanks so much. Oh, one quick comment. Uh, I